Okay, Jeff's going to introduce our uh, next speaker. Hello, sir. Welcome back. I am uh, delighted to get to introduce our next speaker uh, to you, Miss Belinda Dinwiddie, and now she's a have one. I knew you when you were uh, when you were just a Belinda. Yeah, yeah. Now you're not. Um, when I was thinking about introducing Belinda, um, I wrote down this sentence um, as a way to describe her. Someone who genuinely enjoys the whole process of development and relationships and connecting people with the joy they should feel when contributing to something that matters to them. Um, Belinda and I, by the way, have known each other for quite a few years. Uh, when I was with the Governor's Books and Birth Foundation, uh, Melinda did a couple of sessions for us. We get together, all of the affiliates across Tennessee every year, and Melinda did a couple of sessions for us that were uh, received much of, of praise. And so um, when we were thinking about putting this session together, <coughs> and who we might get to come talk to such a diverse group of people, uh, Melinda immediately came to mind. One of the challenges uh, that I mentioned in the previous session is the diversity of the group. You really have a number of sizes, you have a number of community partners, um, a number of funding resources available locally or lack thereof. And so it makes it really difficult, I would say. I'm sure Belinda would do a fabulous job, but if I were faced with doing this, I would be, I would be concerned. It would be really challenging to try to speak to everyone. Um, so, when Belinda and I got together and started talking about this, uh, she said, you know, hey, who, who am I talking to? And, and, and I said, Sit, are you sitting down? <laughs> it's going to be a challenge. But Belinda is well equipped. I want to tell you a little bit about her. Um, of course, she has extensive experience, including being uh, the former Chief Development and Community Relations Officer at the Adventure Science Center in Nashville for eight years, which included overseeing a $50 million capital campaign. Uh, she was a former executive director of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation of Tennessee, uh, former director of development and community relations for the Middle Tennessee Office, Office of Junior Achievement, and has served on the board and leadership roles for a cross sector uh, in Nashville, including the Nashville Zoo, the Center for Nonprofit Management, uh, the Nashville Museum of African American Music, Rotary, Nashville Chamber of Commerce, Association of Fundraising Professionals, and the Fund Giving Council. Of so she has 30 years of experience. This is a highly, highly knowledgeable person in the realm of development. So I, I can't wait to hear what she has to share with you today. And I'm sure you want to do questions and answers. Sure. Afterwards. So questions and answers afterwards. So ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Belinda Dinwiddie. <coughs> Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? You probably could hear me without the mic, but they told me that I did need the mic. Uh, I have a couple of things that I have to do before we talk about the presentation. Last night, I was walking around, I had forgotten my glasses, and I'd gone up to the front desk to say, do you happen, happen to have a pair of glasses here? And some wonderful lady, Virginia from Western Kentucky, because she, Vicki from Western Vicki, Vicki, oh, there you are, Vicki. These, she gave me these glasses to take back to my room, oh. trusting me. So, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> and I can see the clock. So, I know it. so, thank you so much. And Brittany, are you in the room? Brittany's in the room. I don't know if you people know Brittany, but Brittany's a bud from mine for a long time. Uh, she's from Nashville, where I am. She was with the Center for Nonprofit Management. And she was in charge of all the education, so anytime that I taught classes there, she was the one that would introduce me or come in and keep me on schedule. So Brittany, your job is to make sure that 15 minutes before I'm supposed to stop, that you do something so I know where I am. Okay? Well, I am very delighted to be here, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to you. When Jeff and I did talk, it, it is an interesting thing when you have uh, organizations that are raising money and you're a one-person volunteer shop or maybe two people or you have a staff but the principles are very very simple and they're very much the same no matter what you do and today <coughs> we can talk about lots of things to do with fundraising but today we're going to focus a little bit on understanding the difference between just fundraising and stepping out of that role into a development role how we take 
that you all are very good at, at finding, uh, doing events and having money that does annually, but how do you maybe do some major gifts in there? How do you maybe add a legacy program in there? What are the components? What do you need to know to do that? And that's kind of what we're going to talk about this morning. Before I start that, I want to show you what I did bring. What are these? Imagination Library. These are from my house. My granddaughter, our youngest, we have six grand. Oh, I'm still talking this time. We have six grandchildren. And um, I also don't do real well with technology. Um, but the, but I grabbed these um, from my granddaughter, who did tell me I had to bring them back. Uh, and wanting to know who's from Rutherford County here? Anybody? I have Rutherford County books because my daughter lived in Rutherford County for a little while, and Davidson County, which I know that contingency is here also. So I have my own. I wanted to show you. I'm a part of you. So if we look at this, if my goal today would be to make sure that when you walk out of here that you feel confident that if it's one donor, two donors, ten donors, depending on your side, you feel more comfortable to say, how do I get them to the next level of donations? So at the end, let me know if I accomplished that. But let's talk about it because relationships are the key, and it's all about the same thing that you look at when you talk about an oak tree. When we plant a tree today, it takes a number of years for it to grow. 20 years, the one that, you know, it, the, the best time to plant one of those was, you know, 20 years ago. But today we can start that process, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Before we go into everything, let's talk about cardinal rules. If you look at simple rules to do with fundraising and development, this is what they are. People give to people, not causes. Now, that's going to sound a little bit silly and a little bit because it's going to be, but you're going to tell me it's mission-based and all that kind of stuff. But people actually give to people, and they give because you help people, not because you have needs. So people give to people. That is an important thing. You get money from the, you, some of you get money from states, from organizations. We're going to focus a little bit more today just on individuals. So this is very relevant to that. Um, it's all based on relationships. And we'll learn more about that. People give because you meet needs, not because you have them. They are not giving to you because you need to buy books. It's because of what those books are going to do for the people that you need. So the things that you were, uh, you were talking about, how is it relevant to them? What does it mean to them and to the people that are around? And people also give at different levels when they become involved with you in some way. Yeah, all of us will experience those kind of things, but if we look at it, people give for many different reasons, but they do give when they're involved. Most of us have been doing a lot of fundraising. We do a lot, we do events, we do some annual campaigns, we go around. All fundraising is really is transitional. It is, it's focused on the solicitation. I need to pay for postage, so I go down for postage money. I need to buy books, I need to pay staff. It's transitional, it's short term, one-time gifts. Most of the gifts that are in what you call fundraising are more, you know, smaller, more modest gifts. And what I want us to think about in terms of is to look at how do we go into relational kind of development. It is really the process of creating, enhancing relationships with donors. It is strategic in nature. I was really glad to hear Jeff talk about where the organization wants to be in 10 years, and all of you are looking. Are you going to grow your programs by 10% over the next few years in the same way? That means you have to have more money, right? One of the, the things that go on. Uh, so everything about development is relational step and turn. Um, it's Leslie. Leslie. Leslie and, Anna have, and I have a relationship because we were walking down the halls about yesterday and she was looking at her Fitbit, was it Fitbit? And we were talking about steps. Now, we have a relationship that is different than that. If I stayed here for the rest of the time, because when I walked in, her husband said something to me about, okay, we got all of our steps in, because I said, I didn't do my steps yesterday, I was just going to take her steps. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you think that's a good way to do it? You know, if you're wrong, you just take somebody, who has the most steps in the now? I'm going with that. But, but the other thing about relational development and relationships is it's based on donor need. Almost always, we focus on 
our need, our organization's needs, what we think we need, but we're not really thinking about what the donor needs. And as we go through this kind of today, I, I hope we kind of look at a little bit more ways to look at how do we do what the donors need us to do, because relationships is based on that. <clears throat> when you have great relationships within organizations, with people particularly, they become continuous. They're powerful. They can even be long-term, lifelong relationships. And that's what we want to take you to, is to go from a transition to development and fundraising. Okay, so why is it important? Well, it is important because that helps us to do those unmet needs that we have. All of us are doing some of it, but we have things that we want to do more. So it's important to have this kind of relational fundraising for that. It's also important when we start looking at it because, again, let's go back to the needs of the donors. If the donor is engaged and the donor understands about this, then it's engaged. Just like when we were talking about the, the books here, I'm really thrilled that, that they, all these books were given. Was it a million? Did somebody say a million? hundred million books? The books that I was concerned about or what? Yours. The books that my granddaughter got, mm -hmm. right? I'm glad all those other kids are getting books, but they're not my kids. Mm -hmm. And so it comes down again to what does it mean as a, as a donor? How do I become involved? How do I get connected? How do I feel the same thing that you guys know that all of those people need to feel? It is based on your program and your mission, and I was thrilled to see the wonderful materials that you have. That is great. You don't have to develop it yourself. You've got those materials. But how, what I want you to be able to do is take those materials and to put the personal touches with them. Um, I, I think you ask about the question about how do we make it relevant to our community, that that research is great. And, and that's all you're going to have to do those individually. But a lot of that will come down to your individual stories. Because when we talk a few minutes about how to talk to people rationally and emotionally, I'll explain a little bit more about why the stories of individuals that are impacted in your community are important and not just the overall community about it. The other thing that Jeff and I talked about is that some of you are exploring having an endowment program, getting programs that will sustain your programs long term. You will not be able to do that unless you have developed relationships that you have done with people so that it makes you get to those major and the ultimate gifts as you go along. Because it's not the person who comes to an event usually, they may end up, may, may end up being that, but it's not somebody that comes to an event, somebody who puts it at your, uh, money at your festivals, buys little tickets, it's those relationships that do that will lead you to the other things and lead you to the major gifts and the ultimate gifts. So, if we look at what development truly, truly is, it is about these four things. It is a process that includes all of this, and it has to include all of this. So when you look at how do you take a donor, and I'm sure if I ask you, if you stop and thought for a minute, do each of you have a donor, it could be five donors, ten donors, but do you have a donor that given the right circumstances could make you get a $25,000 gift, a hundred thousand dollar gift, maybe even a million dollars. Each of you have somebody in your mind that under the right circumstances, I don't mean they're ready today, but the right circumstances could do that. Do most of you feel that way? That you have somebody in there? No. Well, no? no? Yes? Microphone. Microphone. I'm sorry. Sorry. Microphone. Thank you. <laughs> About doing that. Okay, so part of the first part of the process is the different who is that donor? Who are those donors? You've got to identify who they are. And that comes from many different things. You get to qualify the, the, the prospects. Is it somebody who works within your organization as a volunteer? Is it a board member? Is it a community leader? Who is it and who are they that are in yours that you can identify have the potential to be the kind of prospect that you want to be able to take you to the next level of giving them? And only you can do that. I could come in with you and we could talk to your donors, but we would, I would ask you questions like, how long have they been giving? Have they ever given before? Are they giving to other things? What is their interest level? Those are the kind of things that you have. So once you've looked at that and you start saying, okay, I have identified these prospects, 
I've looked at what their capacity is, and I now need to find out a little bit more about them and their passion. Then that takes us into cultivation. Again, you guys are running programs. You're, you're, you're uh, making sure the lights are on. You're answering the phones. You're doing everything. So how do you spend the time on moving to the next level? Well, that's why I want you to look at just one donor, two donors, three donors, whatever donors work for you to start the process. Because then we need to do cultivation. And cultivation is that that is going to get them involved with you. You want to be able to get people that, 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 that you can say that they have this relationship with you and that are a part of you. Like Leslie and I are now have a relationship. Anytime we run into each other, we're going to talk a little bit about this. But you're wanting to take that further. And there are many, many different ways that we look at cultivating folks. Um, uh, we could go into a long, long list of it, and I'm willing to answer questions. But some of the major things that you should be looking at <coughs> is excuse me, inviting them um, personally to your things, involving your board members. If you have a gala or an event, have them be a special guest. Finding out what their interest is and cultivating them, looking at a process to get them more in involved, interested, and informed about your education, I mean about your organization. Okay. After we do all of that, then we are into the portion of where we have to solicit them. Now, this is going to be way down the list because we've got to cultivate for a while, but solicitation is the process also because you'll see this somewhere else, but rarely does anybody ever give you money, and particularly big money, if you don't ask for it. That's one of the biggest things that we have. I remember early on when I was at the, um, at the, the junior achievement, I would sit in my office a lot. And I would do data, and I would look at pieces of paper, and I would write up things for events. Well, that didn't really get me in, in as much at doing it because unless you ask people, they don't get. And so eventually, whoever we have cultivated, we have to solicit them. And if you've gone through the process of identifying them and then cultivating them, going through a process, with them to let them learn about them, then you will be able to solicit them and ask them for money. When you get a gift, and many people that you're going to be doing this process with may not be at the highest level that you want them to get yet, but the, the last part of this is the most important because if somebody ever gives you any money, one of the biggest things to ever getting money again is the stewardship of that. Thanking them. 50 to 60 percent of all gifts are one-time gifts. And why is that? Because there's not the stewardship. We don't really reach out to them in the way. Now, can you do that with every one of your donors? You can at least thank all of them. But the ones that you're cultivating to move to a different level, you have to steward them in a different way. Because stewardship is nothing but cultivation after they've given you some money. Because this whole process goes around in a circle, and you'll see that in a little while, that you identify people, that you cultivate them, you solicit them, and you steward them so you can go. Your best prospect is somebody who's already given to you. That's one of your best prospects that you have in, in, in your pocket already. If you look at this pyramid of giving, this kind of re reinforces what I was saying a little bit. I want you to think in terms of this, kind of like friendships. If you look at annual giving, which is kind of most of us do, those are event driven, they may be uh, papers, a book, underwrite a child, um, I'm not sure what all methods that you use, but those, you know, fairly smaller gifts, depending on your organization, your, your small gift may be $25, somebody else's small gift may be $1,000, but it is those annual gifts, they may come back to you a lot of times, they may be transactional in nature, such as, like we talked about events, doing that. Those are your annual gift givers, and those are at that level that you kind of got a contact with them. Then you move up to major gifts, and you begin to cultivate them, and, and do that process of moving them up the ladder, if you will look at the right side here, let me talk about that. And eventually, for those of you who really want to look at long-term underwriting, planned gifts, legacy giving, endowment giving, we're talking about ultimate giving. And I was thinking about this the other day, and I kind of thought about that 
that how do we have friends? All of us have friends that we would talk about and say, oh, Leslie's my friend. I met her at a conference and she's my friend. But I really don't know much about her. But we're friends, we laughed in the hallway, and we'll continue to do that. If I look at people that are major guests, those are people that we go to dinner with, right? When you look at it, we have people we go to dinner with, we go to the theater with, we see them fairly frequently in our life, and they are like our major givers. They are really supportive of us, they are part of our lives. But who are those four or five people in your life that are the ultimate, that, that you can tell the one story to that they won't tell anybody else, or that know your secrets, or that are the people that you depend on? That's that same kind of relationship that I want you to be thinking about here, is that we have annual givers or those that are little donor contact. As we move into the major, we have donor growth. We can lead them on into that, help them to get information, interest, and involvement. Because if we don't have those things, we don't move them to the next level. Understanding the sources of gifts are very important because as we look to more major gifts, and if you do, are going to look at an endowment program, many of those come from different ways, these are the sources of gifts. Most annual gifts come from donors' income. You ask me if I'm willing to write something, I can write you a $100 check, right? <coughs> That's an annual gift. And those come out of my income. If I'm looking at a major gift, if you were saying, I want somebody to give us $25,000 or $10,000, depending on your organization, it could be $1,000, that say, I gotta stop and think about that gift for a minute. I gotta talk to my husband. And I'm not just gonna write that out. I'm gonna, I gotta know more than I just did before if I'm gonna do that. So I've got to look at that, and many times those gifts come from people's assets. They are appreciated stocks. Um, those type of things are more asset generated. And then when we look at in a state gifts, most of those are ultimate gifts. Those are the gifts that are going to help underwrite a program. Somebody that leaves something in your will, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, leave things in their will, and those ultimate gifts. Those are more from an estate gift. Probably, does anybody have any estate gifts that have come to you? You had one? You had one? Okay. Um, Back here, we have a few, but most of you are not focusing on that, and I understand that at this time. But you've been, a lot of you have been in business 15, 20 years? How long has been somebody? 10? 12. 10, 12. You are at the point of beginning to develop relationships with people that will, could make a gift and a will to you. And that's important to just keep in the back of your mind. I'm not saying that you want to focus on plan giving a lot today. But I do think you want to have that as a part of what it is, because if they believe strongly in you, if you look at what people give, 70 to 80 percent of us give in our lifetimes, only about 15 percent of the people give in their wills. Many people don't have wills. But why do people not give later on? Why do people not give in their will in their days? Because we didn't ask them. Again, everything about this has to do with, with asking. So if you look at the sources of gifts, that kind of helps you understand where you move up the ladder if you want to, where, where you would like to be. Okay. So let's talk about a cycle specifically for major gifts. You've got your annual givers. We're going to take these five people in everybody's organization that we're going to move up the ladder. And I wanted to go a little bit into some of the things that happen here. We talked about that, that you've got to qualify the, the person, their capacity, um, and passion for the organization. So that part starts with identification, but then also the cultivation of doing that. We cultivate them, prospects by your leaders, yourself, other people who are involved with you. The pre-solicitation and solicitation by the right person, and this is really, really important to begin to understand because in the next couple of slides, we'll see who else is involved and how do you find out who the right person is with that. Um, and then stewardship is the cultivation to the next gift. So if you if you involved me and I've given you a gift and you've stewarded me to go to the next level, might I go to the next level with doing that? I won't if you don't do that. Because if you look at the truth, it usually takes about 18 months from an identification to a solicitation for somebody that's in a true major gift thing. 
That's why we don't focus on it the whole time, because we got to have money today, right? You got you got books that I got, I got out the door, you got postage to do, you got staff to be paid, all those things. I understand that I've been very, very small organizations myself. But if you look at it, if we don't start that process, we are never going to get to those 18 months. And that usually for every prospect and a major gift that you have, that you're going to need three of those to get a gift. So if you want to get a $25, $25,000 gift, we need three prospects that are in this process to be able to get that. Because their circumstances may change, right? Somebody gets sick, they get divorced, they move out of town. You don't want that to be your only gift. <coughs> So if you look at, at doing this kind of stuff, and when you look here, I said identify prospects and natural partners. You, one of the things that when you are identifying who um, is involved, this involvement should be multi-level. It should, in, it should also include your volunteers. And every single person that you're going to solicit to have, have two things that happen. They have natural partners that are associated with them. And this is an entire three-hour <coughs> presentation to talk about uh, about that kind of natural partners. But what I want you to understand is, is that for each person that you're ever going to talk of, there is a connection to somebody else that's connected to you. They're connected because they are in business together. They are connected because they are on boards together. They're connected because they're friends. But there are other partners besides you that will help, that need to be helping you with this fundraising process, for particularly for major gifts. So again, look at what we talked about. If you identify, you give them information, you do interest, involvement, you can get an investment from that. But it is this whole process of doing that. One of the things that was, has always been the most difficult for me is that I am a talker. I don't want to listen. I want to talk. That's my husband, who I think is in the room here somewhere. He would probably say that's probably true. Uh, but I don't always want to, want to listen. And I always want to just get it done. Let's just do it. Come on, let's go ask them to do it. Well, major gift fundraising is really about everything you do before the ask. Every bit of the research that you guys have had, every bit of the times that, you, that you've gone to Rotary Club or Kiwanis Club and telling the program, all of that is part of that enabling people and the setup to make it ready. When you go to a Rotary pro program, are people that you want to give in that program? Is that, can that be a cultivation kind of method? Absolutely. If you visit with somebody in their office, if you invite them to a gala. So the thing to remember about major gifts is that the ask, by the time that you generally get around to doing an ask, you know the answer to that ask. If you know, don't know the answer to that ask, you probably don't need to be asking at that time. It may change slightly. You may ask them for one gift and they give another, or you may say, can you do it all at one time? And they say, can you do it over three years? But generally speaking, if you have gone through the process of cultivating someone for the process of time, you will know what your answer is going to be. Because if they don't want to give to you, would they not have told you a long time ago to get lost? Or just stop answering your calls? Yes. So everything about major gifts fundraising and all of this has to do with the setup. The 10% of it is the ask. That's the easy part. Okay, so what motivates people to give? Can you guys tell me, what do you think motivates people to give? Recognition. Recognition. What's some other things? A windfall. A windfall. Who said windfall? Windfall. Impact. Legacy. Warm, fuzzy feeling. Warm, fuzzy feeling. What else? Seeing the needs. <coughs> Seeing the needs. Money to have a legacy. Money to have a legacy. Their personal difficulties. Their personal difficulties. It's one of the ones. Yes? Relationships. Relationships. Connections. Connections. All of those are part of that. People give, what motivates people to give 
has a lot to do with all of those different things you said. Relationships. It has to do with mission. It has to do with involvement. It has to do with impact. What a difference can I make? People want to make a difference in their, in, in their life. If you ask people what they want to do, the, oh, sorry. If you ask most people that if somebody suddenly gave you and you couldn't spend it on yourself, what would you do with that money? 75% of the people always say, I'd like to do something good for my community. What we just want to do is have them give it to us, right? We want, we're the community, and so we're wanting to do it. But if you look at it, what motivates people to truly give is that it's donor-centric in cultivation. One of the things that I have struggled with um, much of my fundraising career is to identify what I wanted somebody to give. <coughs> because I was transactional. I wanted to say, Leslie, I want to be able to add 10 more kids, so can you underwrite the books for 10 more kids? Well, maybe the kids that I'm looking at in this county are not the kids that she wants. Maybe she grew up in a, in a different part of the county and is not in the city. She wants to help the county kids. But I've not asked her. I'm just saying to her, I, what I want you to do. When you look at relational things, Leslie and I have talked, and I have now found out what Leslie is interested in. Is it making an impact. If you were talking to me about this, I brought the books, I'm excited about the books. One of the reasons I'm excited about the books is because I have a, a single mom daughter. My, the, our youngest granddaughter um, and doesn't have a father in her life. Her mother is a, a single mom, been raising her alone, uh, but sometimes I think we help raise her, but uh, with that. But the idea that if this could help mothers and children that don't have the resources to buy books is what would turn me on, right? So talking to me and finding out that so it's very donor-centered, and that's through the cultivation. When you're sitting down to lunch with somebody, not asking them, what are you finding out? You know, you found out the different things about them. Also, there's got to be a deep belief in the mission and the project success. You all are blessed now to have some great information, you probably had a lot of it before, but some great information to be able to say, this is what our mission does, right? You want to be able to do that because that is an essential part of it. You also have to be able to say, why is it urgent? What's compelling about this? We all know kids need to read. And we didn't have to leave, read those statistics this morning to know. We may not have known in the same depth, we may not have known that kids, if they haven't learned by third grade, are going to drop out of school, have a higher propensity to drop out of school. Did I get that statistic right? Is that kind of close? Uh, I'm doing it. But what is the, the case for this? What is the compelling? When you're talking about it, it is not, it is not about these many kids in our community are not involved in the program. It is more about these kids are not going to have the educational resources they need. It's less about the numbers and more about the, 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 the impact that it has for them. And so when you look at that, you have to develop a compelling case. All of you got it. Every single one of you have, have information already that you've seen somebody's life or multiple lives impacted by your program, right? So we should probably wouldn't be sitting here if you did do you each have a story of somebody that came up and said, without this, this would have happened? Or this wouldn't have happened? I would bet most of you do. And so you have to have this urgent and compelling place. But you also, again, have to remember that if with Leslie it's all about what are you doing in the rural part of the county, i got to make sure that the case is for that as opposed to what is it doing in the city. If she's really about the rural part. So looking at that, if we look at that, and then we'll talk in just a second about who's involved, but being asked by the most compelling person. Is there somebody in your life that you can't say no to? That if that friend asks you to do something, you just have to do it, right? <laughs> most of us have that those kind of relationships. Well, in business and in fundraising, we have those same kind of things that are going on. 
that, that there are people that are a part of our organization that can help us with the fundraising because that we want the we want the donor to be asked by the most compelling person. Now I always think I've got to be the most compelling person. But that is not the case. There are sometimes somebody else means a whole lot more to that donor with their personal stories or their reason to be involved or their uh, th their ability to say this is what the impact is, has been. And and that is who we want to be involved. So if you look at that's kind of what motivates them. It's all of this. It's got to be about what they believe in and what they want. It's got to be about your mission and how that is impacting things. But how does it impact me personally? And tell me why it's urgent. One of the things that um, when we've looked at developing case and case statements over the years is um, I love the, the kind of the analogy that you look at when you're trying to tell somebody if there's the urgency to something. And Somebody told me one time, it's kind of like when you're stopped on the side of the road by a highway patrol. Now, all of us get that way, and you know, you're, you're sitting there, and you've, you've been speeding, and this highway patrol guy comes up, and they've got those glasses. Why do they wear those glasses? <laughs> you're so they can't see us. scare us, right? But if they come up to you, they will say, where are you going? Well, I'm going to my mother's house. And, you know, what is the... What is, what, what, why are you going at this speed? Because I needed to get there. What's the urge? Where's the fire? Why do you have to do that today? Right? When they ask you, why are you going? Why are you doing it? Why in the devil are you going so fast? You have to do it. It shows that urgency. So where's the fire? That's what I want you to think about is when you are doing this compelling and the case to them is why is this important? Is it important just to get the books in their hands? No. Because they can just go to the library. But it's all about that snuggling. It's all about that hugging. It's all about preparing. It's all about making our kids ready. Right? It's much more about that. And if our kids don't have this, what happens to them? They drop out. They become a part of society that is not productive. So that's part of that case that we look at. Uh, why is it important? Why is it useful today? Brittany, how am I doing on time? Uh, you're almost here. Okay, I better get going. <laughs> okay, understanding why people give also has a whole lot to do with it, and I was really interested because on the bottom of my chart here it says where the heart and the head come together. Because statistics prove and science proves that people that give money feel better. They are happier, they're less stressed, that it, it does that um, kind of hormone in your body that does make you feel happy. Uh, is it endorphins? Yeah, endorphins. It makes you feel happy. And if you, you know, it's all about, yes, does it solve a problem? Is there a better future? Is, are we happier, believe? But it's where that heart comes together with the mind. If we look at that, we want to connect their feelings with our organization. I want, I want to make my community feel better. I want, to, I want other kids to have the opportunity that my little granddaughter has had. Um, I want to help them share the passion and create those type of feelings that we have. So when you look at people, it's why they give has a whole lot to do more with their heart than their head. They may say to you the statistics about it, but eventually, their heart has to get in. I'm going to skip over something for a minute because I want to show you this part, and we'll come back. A thoughtful and, solic and a successful solicitor asks both rationally and emotionally. The reason I tell you that, I want to tell you two stories. Uh, my husband and I are both very involved with Gilda's Club. Anybody know what Gilda's Club is? Gilda's? Yeah. You know, it's, just, it's a cancer support organization. It does great work. They don't charge anybody to do it. And we both are very involved in that. And if I came to say that I, you know, if I'm, if I'm talking again to my friend Leslie, and I said, Leslie, you know, my, my husband and I are going to walk at the marathon, I'd love you to support that because they do great work. Leslie may do that. Because that's a rational thing. They do good work, they help people. But if I tell you that same story from this perspective, that in um, 2009, I lost my late husband to cancer. 
And I, uh, I remember sitting on my back porch one day and being very disturbed and saying to myself, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to turn. I don't know who to talk to. I don't know where to push. I don't know if I should push. I don't know these kind of things. I wish I had somebody to turn to. Skip ahead some years. I met this wonderful man who also, in 2010, lost his wife to cancer. And in discussions and finally talking to each other about our experiences, I learned about Gildas. And I learned that he went to Gildas and that she, his late wife, went to Gildas and that our grandchildren, that are our grandchildren now went to Gildas, that our children went to Gildas and that through going to Gildas, it helped them deal with this terrible thing that was happening in their life. And I learned the joy of that. I learned of going to Gildas of the joy of what people did. And so if I come to Leslie and I'm telling Leslie that story, that's much more emotional. And you know, Leslie, I don't want somebody to sit on their back porch and not know where to turn. Is that much more of an emotional thing? I can tell you logically and rationally. But when we look at major gifts of fundraising, we've got to have people, us and others, to, I'm glad you have the statistics, but you have to learn the stories that go along with that. Because you really got to marry the heart and the head together. And so people that are involved in that need to be able to do that. When I, when I gave you that story, it was totally different. This organization is still the same right organization. You guys knew it did good work, but you know it from a different perspective. <coughs> So I'm going to scoot back here real quick. Who's involved with major gifts? How many of you, uh, does everybody here have a board? Okay. How, how many of you are completely thrilled with your board's involved? Uh, <laughs> nobody. Yes. Pretty thrilled. Pretty thrilled? Yeah. You say completely. Completely. Well. <laughs> we all feel that way about our boards. How do you just do that more? But, but true soliciting of major gifts does involve your volunteer, your leadership, and your staff. Some, who is not, isn't staffed at all? Some of you just volunteers completely? You should forget that middle part. This part that comes up in the staff, just don't that We can't hear you. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, you want to remember, you're going to get rid of the staff if you don't have staff. But it involves your board and your volunteers and your staff if you're staffed with that. Because everybody has to be involved with that <coughs> process. Um, and the reason that, that that is there, because there are many times that the board members are the ones that can tell the story. Some of my best fundraising calls ever and ever have been with board members who would do just what I did when they said, why are you involved with the organization? And they would say their story about what the difference made in their life. You know me, you know, this is what happened to me, and I want you to help me make sure that doesn't happen to anybody else. And that's why volunteers are very involved. We're gonna do it from the perspective of, it's great, it's wonderful, with statistics, we do wonderful work, but you want that emotional part, and your board members can help with that. So. Why do people, you've got to remember that the number one reason people don't give is because they're not asked. And that's what we have to get to is to these asks. Is to look at what can we do to motivate them so they'll make those asks. <clears throat> okay, if you look at what funders, if you look at people that are giving, what they say we should do, and I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. Because Brittany, what have I got? About 15 minutes? You've got 10 minutes until you need to take questions. Okay. See? <laughs> How good she was with me before helping me with do that is that funders say if you want me to fund you and you really want things these are some things you should do okay you should take time to develop the relationship you should involve your leadership that your volunteers your board members should be involved in this I want to see them because if they don't care enough to give and to come why should I do all of your board members give to your organization Everybody who's got all their board members give to your organization, raise your hand. Okay, so we have a few that don't. We have a lot that do. But those of you who don't, that's one of your first jobs, to go back and make sure your board members give. Because if you're going to say, being able to say also to funders like uh, foundations that your entire board gives, will give you a better chance for funding. But what they want to see that, they want to know that you know the prospect and your interest. 
If you think about that a little bit again, go back to some of the things that I've said, if you're talking to me, what are the things that are important to me? Not are things that are important to you, but are what important to me. They do want to know about outcomes and not just the process. They don't care how you get the books there. They want to know that the books got there. They want to know that Bella wanted me to bring her books back because she likes her books. And that she's reading and she's doing well. They don't really care about the process. And they don't care about our problems with the process. <coughs> they just want to know the income. outcomes. If we tell them the outcomes, we can tell them we can't get to the outcomes without the process. But they got to know that. They say we want to know that. They want to know, they want us to remember whatever their passions and, and their desire for desire, again, goes back to us. What does it mean to me to do that? <clears throat> they also like to know who else is supporting you. So being able to use that, I'm sure that most of you do, but to be able to say, so-and-so is already giving, and we want you to join that. One of the most successful things that I find that board members do is when they will say out loud, you know, Susie and I, John and I, whoever it is, and I give, we want you to join us in giving also. Not that we just want the gift, but I want you to join me. I'm giving up my money, I want you to join me. That works out really well in a lot of business situations when you have competing, but if you're particularly in small towns, I think you've probably have seen that. One bank will give, others want to match that kind of thing. Show that you're sustainable. sustainable Show that we've got a program that is good and that we can keep doing it. Um, tell us that you like their support. They want you to do that. These are things from, from surveys with, from board members, uh, from uh, funders of what they said they want. They also don't like these kind of things. They do not want you to discourage them and to go, well, you shouldn't be asking me that question. If you've got something that's not great about your program, that's okay. Because you can say, we don't do a real good job with this, but if we had the resources, we could do a better job. It's okay to say, we're not the greatest in something, but, it, but, but we want to be able to show this. So they want, they want you to be able to let them talk about it, to give you feedback. The other thing is, don't ask to marry my daughter on the first day. <laughs> Because they really don't want you to ask them. If you're asking for a major gift, and you come to me and ask me for a major gift, and you've not cultivated me, you don't know if I can afford it, you don't know what my passion is, what is my answer going to be? No. My answer is going to be no. And I'm probably going to be a little bit offended. Because you didn't know enough about me to do that. If you know things about me, even if I'm not able to give at the same level, you have touched my heart, and I'm going to do something. <laughs> very, very positive. Um, you don't want to try to convince the donor there's a fit when there is not one. Occasionally, you're going to run into a donor that doesn't really care. I had a donor one time when I was at the Science Center, and that um, had the, everything we thought was set up to be the best thing with this donor. And we get to the end, and we're talking to him about money, and he went, you know, I really don't care about science. It just doesn't interest me. And somebody else can help you with the Science Center. I'm really going to, and you have to like to do hospitals in Guatemala or whatever. Well, there was nothing I could do about that, right? Because sometimes that fit is just not there. So if it's not there, don't, you will know that pretty, pretty soon. Now, interesting story about this person is he was 60 years old. He was probably... 58 that about the time we had this conversation. At 60, he married, and he had a little girl. Now he contributes to the science. <laughs> so, okay, so I'm going to wrap up, before we do some questions, with kind of these 10 truths about funding and about development, is we are not entitled to their support. And that's what's a hard one for me, because I know we do good work. You do good work, right? Your organization does great work, but you're not entitled to the support of anybody. You've got to earn it. And earning it doesn't mean what you're doing, because you're obviously doing great work. Your statistics are, you show what you're doing, the books that you're sending out there, but you've got to earn it from the dollar. Right? 
Development is not magic. It's simply hard work on the part of people who are thoroughly prepared. Again, don't marry me. Don't ask my, you know, can I marry my daughter on a Thursday? Be prepared with that. Fundraising is not about getting money. It's about friends. You have those, you have relationships already in your organization. Those of you who have developed, many of you, 12 years, somebody said back there, if you have done that. When you look at that, you have great relationships with probably, your, many of you United Ways, you have it with some of your funders that you have, your companies that are there, the school system, you have many relationships about it. But through, through true major gift fundraising, it's about raising friends. Not money. Because if you get the friend, you will get the money. You do not raise money by begging for it. You raise it by selling people on your organization. I, I've had a habit of that in the past, a little bit of going and saying, well, but we really need it. Where a program's going to go under if we don't do that. That's not their concern always. It's much more about selling people about what that good could be as opposed to just the organization. Okay, people just do not reach into their checkbooks and give you money. You have to ask them. How many of you have just gotten like a $10,000 check in the mail? Never solicited. Once, love you. I've been doing this for 30 years. I have never but one time gotten a, what I consider to be a major gift. To me, to me, $5,000 used to be a major gift. You know, now it's a little bit different, but I've got a $10,000 gift unsolicited. I nearly fainted in the middle of the room. It's like, $10,000, where is, who is this person? We didn't even know this person at the time. But they don't do it. So people don't just do it. How many of you know other great organizations that you think are do good work? Gilda's? Second Harvest Food Bank, your food bank. Do you give to them all the time? Most of us don't give unless we're asked, right? If somebody asks for it, we do. So, okay, so you can't decide today to raise money and ask for it tomorrow. Yes, we can for the smaller gifts, but if we're going to do the bigger gifts, it's all about the planning. Remember, 90% set up gives us the 10% for the ask. Okay. The other thing is, is I've always wanted to wait, 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 wait for the right moment. I just, one more, one more little cultivation, one more thing. Well, part of it is, yes, I didn't want you to go too soon, but you have to create those right moments. It's, it's, it's all about getting them ready for that moment so that you are ready and the right moment is there. Okay? Um, this one sort of gets me into trouble occasionally because it doesn't always work within all organizations. But when I say successful fundraisers don't really ask for the money, they get others to do that, I do want you to involve your volunteers. Your volunteers, if you look at a bank president to a bank president, are they a little more successful than little old me to a bank president? Or to the head of a community? We want that kind of interaction. Prospects and donors are not cash crops waiting to be harvested. They, you need to treat them as you would customers in a business. So think of that in terms of they are not this, just there to give you money. They're not just there because they've got money. They're there because we want to treat them in the way that we want to, the way that they need to be treated. Okay, Brittany's hanging, telling me I have to wrap it up. So in wrapping up, one of the things that I want, one of the things that was always hard for me is that I don't like to be turned down. Do you guys like to get no's? No. I don't like to get no's. If you'll ask board members why they don't give and why, uh, why they don't like to go on fundraising calls, they'll say, many times they will say, it's because I don't, I don't want somebody to tell me no. I'm going to look stupid if they do that. Well, if we prepare them, they'll be okay. But always remember, you're not asking for yourself. You're asking for those thousands of children in your community that without that are going to be missing something in life, right? You're not asking for you. You're asking for them. 
your organization changes lives and saves lives in many ways, right? You're doing a great job. They do, they do that. The impact that you're making, what is that impact going to be? It's going to do way past all of us being here. When my granddaughter is raising her children, the impact that you guys had, thank you Rutherford County and Davidson County, but it's going to change, has, has changed her life and will change it. And your belief in the mission and what you do makes the difference. You all have the passion. You all have the belief or you will not still be here. Just remember that what you do does save lives, changes lives, and makes impacts for years to come. So I'm willing to answer any questions. See if you've got anything about fundraising you'd like to know. No questions? Sign of a good presentation. Yeah. <laughs> or a really bad one of the other. <laughs> We do have a question. Um, you talked about um, the ask being made by the most compelling person. And on our board of directors, we have Dr. Joe, who knows everybody <laughs> in Jamaica's County. And so he can just call and then they say, how much do you want to make a check out for? He does not have to tell the story. They know. And they've been donors probably for the last 12 years. So. <laughs> How do you train someone to become a Dr. Joe? Right, did you hear the question? No. Okay. She has a, 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 a really a great situation. <laughs> she has a donor, Dr. Joe, who is involved with them and is knows everybody. Board a board member. And is very involved and been involved in some years and um, has a reputation in town that he can call on anyone and they will give him money. He doesn't even really have to tell them what it's for. Or too much, right? That's what she said. So she said, how do we get the next, how do we get another Dr. Joe? Is that what you're asking me? And a, a part of that, there, there's multiple steps with that. But if I was looking at that, I would also talk to Dr. Joe to begin with and say, I want to, we want to expand what we're doing and I need more of you. How do I get another you? Who are some other people in this, org in this community that have much of the same influence that you do that because they don't know about us is not doing that. So I would talk with Dr. Joe about that. I would also talk to other board members that you have to say, we want to expand who is, who are those people that are out there that could be like a Dr. Joe and then cultivate them because he obviously believes in what you do or he wouldn't do it. So there are others that are very similar to him, but you just have to get them to have the same passion. And do we get them? on our board? They can be on your board, probably for most of you, the most effective way is on your board. It, that people don't always have to be on your board to be effective fundraisers. They can help you in other ways if they don't want to. But I would say in most instances, as a board member, you can educate them, you involve them in a different level. And I would identify, if, if you think that your board is not strong enough or you'd like more of those, then part of your overall fundraising plan should be board development. How do we develop three more people in our organization that are Dr. Joe's? Is he a physician? No, he's retired president of the University of Tennessee. Okay. Oh, uh, that uh, helps uh, a little. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, and, and you're not going to have that many of those. She was, he's the retired president of the University of Tennessee. Cuz does put him in a stature a little differently than most of the folks. He knows but he does know everybody. But, but in all of our communities, there are those people that know a lot of people. And there are people that can pick up the phone. And there are people, as we said, even though they may not be able to pick up the phone and call everybody, they can call one somebody. They can call two somebody. It is, it is not about them knowing everybody, but about them knowing the right people. Yes, ma'am. How do you get your board members to give? How do you get your board members to give? Oh, ask or give? <laughs> Okay, she's asked to get. She's asking the question about. Board members that give nothing. Okay, then um, that's a whole another presentation. Could go on for this forever and ever. But um, I personally do not believe that anybody needs to sit on a board that doesn't give. And so maybe they don't need to sit on your board anymore. Because if they're not giving, they're not asking. If they're not asking, then really, do we need them right there? 
So part of it may be board development and that expectation. I was bad early on when I would recruit board members and say, you don't have to do, don't do anything, I just need your name. Yeah. Well, I don't need their name. I need their work, I need their money. And so I think the expectation of putting the expectation out there, and that could be part of your strategic plan. I was just gonna comment on another suggestion for her. Okay, she has a suggestion. You want that? When you, I don't know who asked that question, but when you recruit your board members, it's a great tool to have a board um, agreement that they sign when they start, and one part of that agreement should be, I will make a meaningful gift every year without being asked. And so, if, I always say, I have lots of years in community foundation fundraising also, but I always say you need doers, donors, and door openers on your board, but every board member has to be a donor to whatever capacity they're comfortable with. So it doesn't have to be very much, but I always say at the end of the year when our annual report comes out, I got to have every board member's name on it. So you need to make a meaningful gift, and I don't want you to. I don't. I shouldn't have to ask for it. And the expectation. Could, I mean, do you have that? Yeah. And, and the expectation should be there because and and what you should do each year is every board member, if you're an executive director or one of the senior people, if you met with the board members every year and you had a board packet, and in that was the expectation of. You know, you, this year your personal gift was $1,000. You helped make this many calls. You attended this many board member meetings. What do we help? To, what do you need to go to the next step? That's a great way to, to, to involve them in doing that. You asked, did you ask a question? No. Yes, sir. I just had one other um, comment on the last question that we've used. Is some of the foundations in our community will not give you a grant if 100% of your board members are not providing some level of funding. <laughs> So that at least spurs them to, if you have a stewardship um, requirement, that will at least give something so that you're eligible for applying for other grants. And, and, and you're seeing more and more foundations that are going that, that, that they require boards to do that. Particularly, they may give you some smaller grants, but if you're doing any kind of big program grant, then many of them will not give in that respect if you don't have one. Um, but the expectation with boards need to be there, and when board members help you recruit other board members, that expectation needs to be there. Any other? Uh, well, I am very proud of what you guys do. I'm very pleased that I had the opportunity to have a granddaughter that gets to read the books because I got to read a lot of the books, and they're some of our favorites. And I wish you the best of this conference, and thanks for all the great work you do.